This is a podcast about the hardcore community. Made by and for those who live authentic lives and embrace hard truths. We archive the stories of the bands and people who make this lifestyle possible. I'm Josh Lyon. And I'm Greg Benoit. And this is the Hardcore Archive Podcast. All right, welcome to the Hardcore Archive podcast. Uh, I think this is episode number 135. Uh, I'm Josh Lyons. With me, as always, is Greg Benoit. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking with Damien from As Friends Rust, and he's been a part of a bunch of other bands that we're going to talk about briefly. Um, we've had a few other people who have been in South Florida bands, so it'll be kind of cool to connect some of these dots together. Um, so I guess before we bring, uh, Damien on, I will, we'll say what's up to Greg real quick. How are you doing tonight, Greg? Oh man, I'm hanging in there. Uh, I got some good conversation topics for our interview with Damien tonight. I was looking over some of the lyrics to the new, uh, as friends rust, and a lot of them are feeling really topical to what's going on in my life right now. So I'm eager to get in and hear about some of the song, the lyric writing process and, you know, how as friends rust is doing. Well, you sound a little bit more prepared than me. I told you guys both before you jumped on that I've been pretty busy with the kids this week. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll maybe I'll follow your lead a little bit on this one. Uh, how's it going with you, though, Damien? Going well. Pretty good. Keeping busy. Yeah, I hear that. I hear that, man. Summertime is definitely a busy time. Um, so, yeah, I don't know where we're going to start. I guess we'll start in the beginning. Um, like I said, I know we're going to talk about Ask Friends Rust and everything you got going on now. Um, but I know... You have a lot of a lot of like South Florida uh, connections, so maybe we'll start there. Um, did you grow up in South Florida? I did, yeah. Um, well, w- we moved to South Florida, I guess, when I was uh, six or seven. But yeah, most of my my childhood was in uh, Miami, North Miami Beach, uh, most of it. Um, yeah, that's where it and started. Then, okay, so. This is weird because some of you guys moved from. I can't I can't imagine spending your your childhood in the south and now living in in the north and dealing with the shit we have to deal with uh, like nine months out of the year, basically. You know. Yeah, it's all right. Uh, uh, there's not much worse than than like that tropical humidity uh, to me. So I'm all right. Although Michigan actually gets pretty humid as well. Yeah. Um. As we're recording this, this week's been fairly humid because I take my kids everywhere and. I was telling my girlfriend, I was like, I don't know what the fuck's going on with my sinuses. And she's like, it's probably, it's probably just walking in that humidity this week or whatever. Yeah. Um, so let's kind of talk about the, like the early, like, how did you kind of find uh, punk and hardcore in South Florida? Uh, was this like the early nineties and I'm guessing? Uh, yeah, early nineties. Um, I would say, uh, it was, it was seventh grade, I think was sort of the transition from, um, I, I had been. I came to it through through metal. Um, I was into hard rock and metal, kind of as 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 far back as I can remember, like having any choice of of what radio you know stations I listened to. So uh, anytime I could catch um, Ozzy or you know Van Halen or or whatever on the radio, I was uh, thrilled. And then you know started buying um, metal tapes. Quickly, kind of realized I was I was into thrash um mostly uh and then i think just from from being into like thrash metal you know there's it's not it's not a big leap to uh to some of the like punk and hardcore stuff uh you know just looking at t-shirts and band photos and and uh the old thank you list thing and and uh and and then the backs of uh, metal magazines were huge for me uh they would advertise like shirts and rings and you know things that you could order from all these different bands and uh and every now and then there would be um some imagery that would strike me and it was uh i always think of of exploited and corrosion of conformity as being like the two that really kind of leapt out and um and i could tell exploited was a punk i mean i knew what punk was just from you know mainly from tv i guess uh but big mohawk must mean must mean punk right um and uh, in Corrosion of Conformity, I didn't really know what to make of uh, until until later. I guess I kind of realized they were truly the the first like American kind of hardcore band that I had heard. But from there, I kind of uh, I started getting into punk and hardcore kind of simultaneously, like deviating from rock and metal uh, a, a bit. And then uh, I think it was basically Minor Threat, Agnostic Front, stuff like that, the New York hardcore comps that. Uh, 
that gave me like the terminology. That's when I finally understood that what I was listening to, what what COC, uh, what I for an I was 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 hardcore. And uh, and I think once I knew what to call it and I knew what to look for, uh, I just kind of went all in. And by that time, metal this was like ninety one ish. So Metallica had released the Black Album. Uh, it w- it was over uh, for me. So it was it was pretty easy to kind of shift gears and jump headfirst into like hardcore punk. So like a lot of people, I mean, I, 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 I'm obviously we've learned on this podcast and you kind of described it. That's that most people either enter into hardcore and punk through either uh, punk rock or metal. Um, but I guess my question is like, did you kind of stay like in touch with your metal roots for a little while or did you just kind of like get right into hardcore at that point? I think at first I jumped pretty, pretty much headfirst into hardcore. Um, <clears throat> metal was yeah it was taking a weird turn in general um i think like the 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 uh the groove the pantera kind of influence was was changing metal uh in the course of like a year you know all the all the hair and all the solos were gone and um everything was kind of getting this like big uh testosterone injection you know it was like it was very like chest pounding and and it was like tough times you know for uh metal just it lost its brutality and it it tried it tried a little too hard to be like street tough you know and it was just kind of boring for me so meanwhile i i gravitated toward a scene that was like all that anyway right (laughs) especially like new york uh hardcore kind of stuff um but it was different because it was just it hadn't been something else that I loved and changed. It just, it was this new thing that was, uh, it was just different. It was more, more approachable, but yeah, the, you rarely meet, you do sometimes meet kids that like the first music that they ever really got into was hardcore. And that's kind of, uh, that's cool. It's weird. It's weird to me to not come to it from somewhere else. Cause that's all I know, but that must be kind of cool, I guess. So I know from talking to some people, like I said, we've interviewed, well, when I did the podcast separately, I interviewed your old bandmate, Rich Thurston. And then recently we've interviewed, um, what, Chip Walbert, Greg? And uh, I feel like we've done a couple other South Florida interviews. But what I'm getting at is, I know at least from talking to Rich, it seemed like the early 90s, like when you went to shows there, they were pretty violent. Like when you went to your first couple like bigger hardcore shows or any hardcore shows there, was it like pretty crazy? Like, Like stepping right into that kind of shit, you know what I mean? Yeah, it was. Uh, uh, and, and not just hardcore. I mean, it, well, for starters, um, Florida always had like very mixed bills, uh, even back then, you know, it was it was there were hardcore shows and there were punk shows. But uh, if it was a local band heavy show, like there were kind of no uh, no restraint. You'd have like a ska band and a pop punk band and a and a hardcore band and a metal you know band all playing together. Um that might've been what kind of bred some of that violence, but yeah, it was, it was a pretty, it's a tough place to live in general. It's, it's a big city. People are angry. It's fucking hot and expensive. And, uh, they're, they're just, there are a lot of, there's a lot of clashing, you know, and a lot of, uh, just people are kind of wound up the way I, I always kind of felt like that about like Boston or something where it's like, man, you just look in everyone's eyes as you're walking down the street and you're like, everyone wants to fight here. Like they're just, they're looking for a fight. And Miami kind of always felt like that too. It was just, uh, people were, were tightly wound and volatile and kind of ready to, ready to snap. It felt like, uh, at least at that age for sure. So I remember, uh, yeah, shows were always sort of, um, scary, dangerous, you know, you kind of stayed out of the way if you didn't know anyone yet, which is, you know, what you do in the beginning, I guess. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it was wild. It, it wasn't until later when I started touring and kind of sampling other uh, scenes where I was like, wow, you guys have a, a a much more laid back, cool kind of, you know, amicable like thing going here. Everyone's just really chill and nice. Strange. Do you remember like any of those first like couple shows that you went to, or, like any of the first bands like for hardcore that you saw, I guess? Uh, I remember like the first, the first touring, I don't know if it was the first, yeah, I think it might've been the first was a like non-local show or non-party or, you know, birthday party or backyard kind of band thing. 
was uh, exploited um, with Biohazard and Typo Negative, uh, who I, I didn't know who they were yet. Um, I only caught exploited. Uh, my friends who I was supposed to meet there and get a ride back with had already left by the time I took the last bus down to like South Beach. So I walking into that was like pretty terrifying because it was uh, it was all like much older people. And, you know, uh, it's an exploited show. So like they were they were grizzled and they were drunk and uh, and I was small and. Um, you know, no cell phone, I didn't know how I was going to get home. Uh, so that was kind of, that was, that was terrifying. <laughs> and then I remember just other shows, uh, on South beach at like Washington square was, it was a, a, a venue that was kind of popping off at the time. And, um, before I had a lay of the land, yeah, just kind of watching, watching, uh, the tension always there were, there were, there were just always like people stepping to each other and, you know, you, you, you learn rich, rich and I have talked about this a lot. You kind of learn in cities like that um you have like an intuition you know when to stop looking you know you know when to kind of like go do something else you know how to blend in you you know enough to not to usually uh not be the target um and stay clear of it uh but yeah that's 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 also an intuition or or a skill set that uh that you realize later not everyone develops because you don't have to in a lot of places. The shows were like, no, go ahead. No, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Shows were basically like, uh, it, it was the same. You had to, you had to be able to navigate shows the same way you had to know how to like walk home from school safely, you know, and not get rolled up on by a, by a car and get jumped or whatever. And that's kind of how just Miami felt, uh, in general at the time. Yeah, it's crazy because before we interviewed you guys, like, I don't know about Greg, too, but like, I, I mean, I went to Miami once, like on a vacation and I never really knew, like, even Miami itself was kind of like sketchy because like I flew down there and then I caught a bus from like Orlando or somewhere to Miami or wherever I caught a bus to Miami when I got off the bus in downtown Miami. I'm like, holy shit, this is crazy. You know, like I was chilling on South Beach for the week, but I wasn't expecting Miami to be like you don't you don't get that impression of it you know what i mean like the, sh the shit they show on tv is definitely not that you know and i was like just kind of floored by yeah. that you know i think it's um, that miami if you if you have the means it can be the miami you see on tv you know but like the 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 bar is pretty high um economically like to to be able to enjoy miami which i mean it's a it is a beautiful place you know the colors are really saturated there's so much culture and music and food and and uh and yeah if you can if you can um carve out a, a nice little life on the on the ocean and you know enjoy enjoy it uh i think it can be that miami but yeah for most people it's it's not it's not so i guess like do you have the itch to do music and, and be in bands like before hardcore or did that kind of come like more as you got into hardcore um I never had the itch. I was just, um, I was invited by some friends to, to sing for a band because the singer that they had was like left and they wanted to start something new, change the name. Um, I was one of a, a handful of kids that were into punk or hardcore in, in, in my high school. Uh, so they grabbed me. Um, I always joke that like I, I had a shaved head. So I just kind of, they were like, well, get him his head shaved. Um, cause they were, they were really like just a handful of us. Uh, and that was, the band had been called Midget Stew and, and then we changed the name to U.S. Decline, um, who later put out like a, a tape and started actually playing shows, um, uh, after I was out of the band. But, uh, that was my first experience. It was, it was nothing that I had thought about doing or, or ever had a desire to do. I was just a fan. I was, I just liked listening to music and, you know on on my walkman and like flipping through magazines or zines or whatever and that's about as far as it went until i got that invite but then once i started i was like oh shit i kind of like this and i just stuck with it yeah now you've been in like <clears throat> 78 bands at least it seems like <laughs> something like that yeah <laughs> um so i like i said i know the first band that we're really familiar familiar with was is culture but like were you in, you were in a few bands before that i get i gather though like for a few years right 
I did, um, U.S. decline was pretty short-lived. <clears throat> then the, uh, I did a band with the bassist of U.S. decline and a couple of other friends called uh, Insist. That was also pretty short-lived. We, we played once or twice. So it was maybe like a, I don't know, everything felt longer back then, but it was looking back, it was probably a six month period, you know, eight months maybe of practicing and writing songs and then playing shows or playing a show. Um, and then after that, half of, uh, half of Insist joined with half of Organized Pain, which was a band that John Wiley for Morning Again uh, had been in prior to to joining culture or whatever. So organized pain broke up at the same time and sis broke up. We, we merged, uh, including the singers. There were two of us. Uh, and that band was called reach. We also played one show that was probably over and done with uh, in a, in a few months. And then I started doing a project called hand over fist with a couple of friends. And then I was asked to uh, try out for culture. So it was, it was all pretty, pretty quick. Um, and then once I joined Culture, that's kind of when like the first kind of real band stuff was happening where like I'd never been in a studio before. That happened very soon after uh, uh, joining. Um, had never played like multiple shows with the same band or driven out of town for a show. Uh, any of that. Cult culture was like a lot of the firsts for me. So when you joined Culture, um, had the lyrics already been written or, or did you get like a fresh start for, for your own writing? When I joined, um, they they told me at the practice where I tried out that I was in and that we had studio time booked in 10 days for an album. <laughs> so at the time, uh, there were going to be 10 songs on the album. Seven of them were already written. So I just learned uh rich's vocal rich rich had been singing and playing guitar i learned the the lyrics that rich had written and then i wrote lyrics somehow in a week and a half to three new songs um we trashed that recording um and then we went back like a month later to take another stab at it and by then it was like five and five instead of seven and three and then uh I don't know what, why we didn't why we decided against the second uh, iteration of that album, but we went back a third time, <laughs> and then it was like we were practicing so much and writing so so quickly at the time um, that by the time we finally went in and did what the version that became uh, the released uh, LP, Born of You, it was seven of my songs and three of his, and yeah, and then kind of from that point on, I just wrote uh, all the lyrics. Nice work on inverting that ratio of uh, yeah. three to seven and then seven to three. I think, I mean, that sounds really inefficient, but I think that's probably the optimal way to like write an album because I find in my own songwriting, I feel like a song is done, is just about done as soon as we get to the point where we're dropping it from the set because it's so old. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's now, when you're kind of working out all the kinks and, yeah. Oh, oh God. Every time I've recorded, I'm like, wow, this is it. This is the best recording I've ever been on. I'm like, I'm so proud of this. And then like months go by and I'm like, oh, I'd, I'd like play these parts totally different if I, if I like had to record it again. Yep. Uh, when you, uh, when you joined uh, uh, culture from the onset, were, were you guys uh, all about having like sociopolitical lyrics? Um, was it like that the intent from, from the onset? Uh, Cause I noticed like some like morning again, culture, they tend to be like more socio-political stuff coming up and that's in as friends rust, but that seems to be more of like um, just like a life experience, the human experience type of lyrics. Yeah, it was no it, uh, culture. Initially I was a fan of, of culture because uh, they had already done a four song demo and two of those songs were on a, a seven inch, the, the band's first release. Um, I really loved the demo. Um, but part of what I loved about culture, about, about that demo, was the lyrics were just um, personal. It was, it was kind of like uh, just really depressed, kind of heartbreaky lyrics or just really introspective, maybe more in kind of a, I don't know, snap case kind of, kind of way or something. Um, and 
when I joined, uh, I, I joined a band that like unbeknownst to me was full of uh, straight edge kids. And I was not uh, at the time, but I was um, in recovery or I, I feel weird saying that because I, I think it was sort of a, I, I, it was a mistaken uh, 12 step pro like I didn't I didn't need to be in it but I had had some some uh, some trouble when I was younger and because I you know like got high and whatever get, did what kids do uh, especially kids uh, in Miami maybe um, I was put in these places where they were like okay you have a drug dependence issue uh, and then like the next day would be like you're an addict and then the next day you need to go to 12 step programs and you're, you know, and you're, and you're a kid, like these people that are diagnosing you and deciding you're all these things don't know anything about you or your habits or anything. Um, but I, I bought it. I was, I mean, mainly cause I was trying to like get out of those places and that situation. So I was like, Oh yeah. And, and you, and you drink the Kool-Aid and you're like, yeah, I'm, I, I got to go to these meetings and, you know, do all the shit. Um, so I was clean. And I joined a band full of straight edge kids and uh, I was clean, but I smoked actually. So I was still smoking cigarettes because NA meetings. Um, but uh, once I joined, it was like, uh, it, it was, yeah, it was not long after where I was like, oh shit, straight edge is cool. And like, I guess, you know, I'll just stop smoking cigarettes and I'll claim the edge. And, uh, and I did. And very quickly um, once the, once that like Voltron <laughs> was complete, it was like, we're a straight edge band. Uh, I mean, they had sort of dabbled. Um, the, the first four, the first seven inch, um, it, it was really just rich and the drummer, um, Josh, and they were both straight edge. So like nothing was stopping rich from putting X's all over that seven inch, but they really, they weren't a band, let alone a straight edge band. They were two guys that did a recording project kind of. So I don't, I think that, um, they were willing to, to, to be whatever. Um, but that just made things like super easy. And it was, a it was a very easy kind of, um, identity for a band to, to glom onto, uh, at that point in the nineties. And we sure did. And, uh, yeah, we kind of became, I guess, part of that wave of, of, uh, you know, nineties, um, straight edge metallic you know straight edge that's that's when i saw you guys for the first time i think i mentioned to you before we did the interview that i i caught you guys for the first time at that syracuse uh super three-day fest or whatever it was called yeah uh, was. i was only there for the last day because i had whatever but that the day that the gun issue happened and you guys played the same song like a couple times for like a video shoot using somebody else's equipment or something something like that, that. i always yeah forget what the story was there. I think we needed, yeah, we needed like video footage or photos and we didn't get it the day before. So we borrowed yeah. like Reed's gear and just like played another, played again. Yeah. Yeah. So that was my first time. I think you guys were supposed to play there again later too, but, 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 but the point is, is obviously Greg and I are an hour and a half uh, west of Syracuse. So uh, we definitely know about the being in the epicenter of the, the mid nineties uh, straight ed scene, obviously, you know, so yeah. were you guys, were you guys like kindred spirits with bands like that? Like, like earth crisis, one King down, like shit like that from our region or like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, earth crisis. We were, we, we had, we had a good kind of uh relationship with them. I remember kind of walking around a parking lot with, with Carl, like exchanging kind of lyrics we were working on. And I, I think we definitely saw each other as sort of uh, like sister bands, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. For a minute. But we were also kind of associated. We, it's, it's weird for a band that had such self-assured kind of cocksure, you know, like uh, dogma to kind of uh, to realize this in hindsight. But like we kind of didn't know anything really about that scene outside of the little bit of it that we had in South Florida. Um, none of us had really done a lot of touring yet. It wasn't that easy to, you know, we, we hadn't like navigated the whole like mail order kind of hardcore kid thing yet. So a lot of it was almost like, uh, um, just these little flashes that we would get of like, 
what those scenes were, what those lifestyles were. And, and we, we, um, I think it's fair to say we maybe kind of like rushed some of them without fully understanding them. And I, I remember like feeling pretty uneasy, um, not just me, but several, several of us in the band, like when we started to, to realize the, uh, uh, all of the baggage that came along with being a, a rather militant, you know, uh, straight edge band or, or later like straight edge vegan band. We were, we were like, wait, wait, wait. So what's a hardline band. And they're like, people think we're that. And, and then it started getting real, really weird. So they were, uh, we, we benefited from that sort of kind of easy, uh, categorization. Um, but we didn't like a lot of the, uh, the shit that came with it. And, and I remember like stay, steering clear of like, um, you know, the, the vegan rights and statements and raid and like abnegation, day of suffering, all that stuff. So it almost, in a weird way, it kind of being in a straight edge vegan band made me, um, not want to hear or buy or go see or know anything about any other vegan straight edge bands. Cause I was like, there was a stigma that I, that I didn't, I didn't like even then. And what about all that shit that was popping off in like, what was it? Belgium, the H 8,000 scene or whatever. W were you guys torn with all those bands and shit too? Like, was that like liar and Congress and all that? Yeah. In, uh, in like late 96, I came back to culture um i'll jump ahead a little bit uh i i left did morning again after that shy Halud, um or i think during shy Halud. uh bird of Elomen started as for Andrust, all that stuff kind of that was 95 96 and then uh at some point in 96 i came back to culture um and that's when we uh pretty soon after that uh our first european tour was booked and um yeah, we had, we definitely had, uh, there was a, I always joke about how like Michigan or Ohio, there, there's like a weird Florida connection between Michigan. Like I live here and everybody that I know in Michigan goes to Florida like regularly. Um, I feel like without realizing it, there was definitely a sort of a, a bond between um, Belgian hardcore and, and American art, you know, hardcore. I think they were doing it, uh, a lot more regularly um it, it was it was part of like that whole scene had been doing slayer influenced creator influenced kind of uh hardcore like metal metallic hardcore um for a long time uh, and and i didn't really realize that to me it was like it was just you know integrity and overcast and uh uh earth crisis a little bit us a little bit and that's kind of that was it and then you go over there and you're like nah man we've been doing this for like a decade um but yeah the we that, that was kind of our our people because we were on good life which was a, a belgian label uh we spent a lot of time in belgium and we got to know all of those bands we did a split with kindred and toured with them morning again uh i don't know if they did a split with a belgian band but they did a lot of touring there also also on good life so yeah we, we we formed some good relationships with those bands and i mentioned before we did the interview too that i know we're going to jump around a lot so if greg if you have more culture questions after this go ahead but i i want to point out because you started mentioning the shy halud thing and I, I at first i told you i was i i didn't realize you were in the band but then as i started researching the interview more i was like oh i do kind of remember this story now so like you were one of the original uh members of the band though right yeah yeah first the first singer um, that was, uh, after I left culture in like 95, um, a mutual friend of mine and Matt Fox, uh, was like, I didn't really know Matt at the, I knew who he was, but I didn't, I didn't really know him. Um, he was like, you should talk to Matt. He's been wanting to start a hardcore band. So I, you know, that's how easy it was back then. Right. <laughs> I just went over and was like, uh, Hey, I was the singer of culture. He, it turned out oh, he worked at a record store. So he, he had born of you. He liked born of you. And he was like, fuck yeah, let's do this. Um, so he had a couple of songs, I think already in the chamber. Um, but yeah, the first, the first as, or the, uh, the first shy Halud practices were, were basically, um, 
Matt would come over to my apartment with his guitar and like no amp or anything and just sit on, we'd just sit on the floor uh, with an unplugged electric guitar and he'd write stuff. And I was just writing lyrics and recording things on a little, you know, handheld tape, tape player. And um, yeah, that was kind of how it started. Yeah. It's crazy. Cause like I said, when I started looking more into the stuff tonight, I was like, I couldn't, I, I didn't realize you had written some of the lyrics that, that Chad ended up using on those, those, those later recordings or whatever. That's yeah. Yep. At least like three or four songs, right? Uh, I'm not sure. I know there were a couple on, I think the first thing they did was a seven inch, uh, one or two of those songs had my lyrics. And then I think maybe something after it might've just been a couple. Um, the, the seven inch, I think has two of your lyrics. And then I think the rest is on that retrospective that they released in like, I don't know, 2006, um, that mostly just had like demo tapes on it. That yeah. was the first time I think I had heard you, um, uh, on a shy halud track so yep yeah the first five or six tracks of that are are the that's the demo that i was on yeah that i shy halud is like one of my top all-time favorite bands so I, I have a lot of uh instant recall for like what's what's where um in, in like their history um just out of curiosity do you like keep up with like what's going on in south florida at all um are you like have you checked out like envision or any of those bands that that are influenced by shy halud and, and culture and morning again no i've uh i'm i mean i'm i'm a i'm a bad hardcore kid <laughs> i kind of to, to be honest it, this is weird too like i'm i'm not sure i've heard a full like poison the well song and that was like <laughs> right on the heels of culture and morning again because once I moved in 97, I moved up to Gainesville, uh, the whole like culture had relocated. And I think a lot of those bands that kind of started getting busy, like right when I left or right after, um, it was just a different world from, from Gainesville. And we were now just kind of looking at Europe all the time and looking up at, you know, playing Dayton and Syracuse and doing like other stuff. And I kind of just didn't really look back for a while. Um, which is, uh, uh, kind of shitty, but, um, no, I think the, the only bands that I've really gouge away, they've, they've since relocated, but, uh, when they came around, I was, I was really into it. Um, who else? Uh, they're not so much a hardcore band, but uh, Rhythm of Fear, more kind of crossover thrash stuff. Uh, I really liked them. There were a few bands that that would pop up on my radar, but even bands that like I later would be in bands and share members with until the end or whatever, I, I've never really heard. Um, yeah, I just kind of didn't, you know, I, it, it also didn't help that I was kind of uh, fatigued. Um, I was like hardcore fatigued in general um, by the, by the like later nineties, I was kind of uh, not into a lot of the stuff that was happening musically. So I don't, I don't think I was in a, any rush to check anything out from, from anywhere for a while. Yeah. Right now is like a good time for people to jump back in who like appreciated the late nineties sound. It feels like that is like more in vogue, like some of those older bands from the nineties and that style is, is really hot right now. Um, but I guess I'll just, they, they don't need it because they've got their, you know, they got, they got a lot of fans, but Envision is, is a band I'll plug very much sounds like, uh, you know, the Shai Halud, uh, uh, full length, but with maybe like Eddie Van Halen on guitar, it's like, oh, that's shit. the most apt description. So yeah, the, the, the gods that built tomorrow, I think is the name of the album that, that really captures that sound. It, uh, does it quite well. Yeah. I'll check it out. Adding we had their we had their guitarist Anthony Burke on a few months back. I had uh, some weird stomach bug, so it's a bottom five interview on my on my end, but uh, still worth checking out if you're listening and you want to hear some Florida bands. Um, yeah. So I guess one thing I'm curious about too is as I was looking at all these bands, like I know you kind of jumped back and forth and like would exit a band for a while and then come back in. Like, were there periods during all this where you were playing in more than one band at a time, or did you kind of try to stick to one at a time, or uh yeah i i the first time that i juggled more than one was um 
once Shai Halud, Shai Halud had already started and then I joined uh, or we started morning again soon after. Um, so I was doing both of those for a while. Then uh, then I was out of Shai Halud doing just morning again. Then I was out of. I think there might have been a minute in 96 where I was not in a band uh, right after the morning again tour. But um but very quickly there was um Bird of Ill Omen as Friends Rust and then Culture uh again, um Culture Take Two. Uh sometime during that as Friends Rust ended. Then I left Bird of Ill Omen, then it was just culture, but then we started as Friends Rust up again with a different lineup in 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 Gainesville. So yeah, there were there were points where I was doing uh three bands at a time. I guess three like active, you know, at, at the time it's, it's all, it's all local and you're just, yeah, you're, you're, you're practicing and playing regularly. So three active bands. It's crazy. Cause back then I feel like each scene had maybe one or two people that would play in a lot of bands like that. But, but now it's like a pretty common thing. Like there's like a, like, like literally like so many hardcore bands now. And when we, as interviewing people, we've realized that it's because they're all in like, like literally like three or four bands. And it's just, it's crazy to look at how many and there like how many good bands we have like active right now, you know. Um I guess um I kind of want to start talking about As Friends Rust. Is there any other stuff you want to get into before we do that, Greg? No, I'm interested to talk about As Friends Rust cuz that's uh I've been listening to them a lot lately, so well, Why don't you fire away with your first uh questions for As Friends Rust then, Greg? All right, yeah. So, um I've been checking out some of the newer songs. Um you guys have uh 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 a CD coming out in August, is it, uh, when that comes out? Yeah, August 18th. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I uh, one of the lyrics that caught me uh, right away was Final Form. Um, that's something uh, recently I had my uh, dog pass away. Um, you know, I got the dog when I was 25 and I'm 40 now. Um, and so those lyrics kind of really hit me, um, you know, at, at this time in my life where I'm reflecting on, you know, what my youth was like and looking forward, hopefully I'll have another 40 years. Um, but that really seems to be like a song that comes from, you know, somebody standing in the middle of their life, looking, looking back. Um, can you tell me a little bit about maybe that, those lyrics and, uh, just, just in general, I'm interested to hear about how your lyrics or how you've perceived your lyrics to have changed, um, you know, as you were writing as a young person, now you're writing as a person in, in middle age. Yeah. Um, well, first, sorry to hear about your your dog. Um, we we also just lost our dog on on July fourth weekend, um, and yeah, she was she was fourteen, so about sounds like about the same uh, same age. Um, that was yeah. It's 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 weird how much. Uh, how much of a hole they leave behind when they're gone like yeah, yeah. and you, you like you like don't notice the passage smells of-, of her bed you know for like two weeks where I was, and then you get bummed because you're like shit it doesn't smell like her anymore it's like just fading fuck man you know that's funny because i have a toolbox that has my grandfather's tools in it and like there was a time when i would open it and it would like smell like his tool shed and it doesn't quite smell like the tool shed anymore but holy fuck if i could like there was a device like a camera that captured smell. I could make a fortune because holy shit, does does that scent scent memory really take you back? Um, yeah. Total total aside there, uh, but yeah, you you don't notice the passage of time, and then you know something happens like a dog dies, and it's like oh fuck, where did fifteen years go? Now I'm old. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean it 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 moves at like a different rate, you know, at different ages. It's so slow when you're a kid, and. Uh, and you, um, you, you, pr- you kind of assume that your youth is endless. You know, aging is not something that will happen to you. That happens to other people. And you're just watching other people kind of get older and you're not really realizing that you are because for a while you're just sort of like, you know, uh, just in, in, in invincible, right? Immortal. And, um, yeah. And I kind of, I, I think that, uh, that song is really just about kind of feeling like um reaching an age where you're like oh i am mortal and and not only that like i might be more more than halfway done i might be two-thirds of the way done uh i mean shit with 
with all the, you know, we, we, we see, we get horrible news about like people passing away all, all the time, you know, uh, at, at really young ages. So I, I mean, it could be, it could be any moment, you know? And I think, uh, it's really just that realization that like, uh, you're not going to be young forever. You're not immortal. Uh, in fact, you know, like sometimes you look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, I feel like I can see myself dying right now. And, uh, and that coinciding with, for me, and I'm 46, so maybe, maybe I got a quite a late start, but like finally feeling like I like this life. I don't want it to end. And, you know, like my whole life, maybe it was, a lot of it was like youthful kind of bravado, but there was a lot of like, ah, whatever, when I die, I die. My time's my time. I don't give a shit. You know, like um, there, there have been points in my life where I pretty actively like didn't want to live, you know, uh, or certainly and, and other parts that were a little bit better where it's, it's not that I didn't want to, it's that I didn't really care one way or another that was kind of as good as it as it got for me for 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 a lot of my uh life and now i'm at a point where i'm like i'm i'm happy here i like this life i i have a son now i have a wife i have you know like i i don't want this shit to end and now it just feels like um now that i'm finally getting the hang of it uh it's out of my control it's just like rocketing you know just it's it's too fast to to slow down um yeah so that's kind of that where it's just like barreling toward toward my my final form which is you know all of our final forms um the casket yeah i gotta say having having kids really made me think about my own mortality in a way that like i don't think i was capable of thinking of it before i had kids um you know, I have two, two boys there, uh, four, he'll be four in a couple of weeks and, and six. Um, and so I like, I kind of have this like weird perspective where I'm like in the middle of a human lifespan, looking at my dad, who's, you know, approaching 80 and my kids who are, you know, they're still, they're still little kids, obviously. So, and, and then I have to tell myself like, well, if I'm lucky, like this is halfway over. Um, but I, I really like hearing you, you know, kind of talk about, you kind of liking life now because that's where I'm at too. I spent like my twenties and thirties white knuckling through mental illness and just trying to act like a normal sane person out in public or when I was, you know, engaging in my family and friendship and work relationships. And now that I finally like addressed that, um, you know, and, 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 and have like a more balanced perspective on my life. I feel like, Oh, Holy shit. I wish I had like done all this when I was 15. I, 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 I could have had a, a different perspective as a young man, but I'm, I guess I'm grateful that I have it now. Um, another lyric I wanted to ask you about too was, um, um, uh, it was a positive mental platitude. Um, that, that one seemed to me, uh, like it was kind of getting at like social media. Um, at least that's what it made me think of with, you know, kind of the lyrics about the hearts and liking things. And, uh, is that the origin of that or is that, am I like totally misreading that? Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of using like the, uh, it, it, it's, it's weird, but this is kind of a common theme on, on the record. There are a lot of critiques, but they're, they're more like observations. Um, it's not, it's not a, a, it's not like a pointing a finger at people and being like, you know, look at this, this, uh, empty gesture that, you know, that you make your, you're so full of shit. It's more like, um, isn't this fucking weird, this thing that we're all doing and why are we doing it? We're doing it because, uh, what I was realizing the other day is, is, um, <clears throat> when you were younger, before smartphones, before social media, you know, you, you'd go out and like, you'd bump into a couple dozen people throughout your day and maybe talk to a handful of them and maybe have like a real conversation with one or two of them. And that was it. I mean, that you, you didn't, you didn't have, uh, all of these constant, um, you weren't constantly updated on everybody's lives. If you're friends with a couple thousand people on Facebook, it's like, you just, 
you're you're seeing like all of the shit and a lot of bad news and um and they know that a lot of their that their bad news is being seen by a lot of people and there's this there's this kind of like implied expectation to like acknowledge it somehow because you can't just read something and just like keep scrolling i mean i'm sure we've all done that too and it and it just feels weird and like maybe sometimes you go back and you're like okay what's the appropriate thing to is it the care react the little huggy heart guy i shouldn't put a heart here right this is devastating um so you do the little care react because that seems to be the um you know i'm not loving this horrible post i'm just showing you that uh that i care but 10 minutes later do you remember what you cared about you know, and, and it's just kind of that, um, again, it's, it's not a, it's not a critique so much of a, of an observation of like a changed shared behavior that like, uh, we now have so much more visibility, this, this, this line of sight into so many people's lives and you're presented with news that maybe you don't want to be presented with, but like, but now you have been and you can't just ignore all of it, uh, so you have this nice, tidy little response that you can do, um, w- which is better than nothing, I guess. Uh, but it's but it's not a whole lot of something. It's I, I, yeah, it's uh, again like if if someone were to ask me what the point of pointing that out was, uh, I don't really have an answer to that. It's more just kind of a like, ain't this some shit? It's, it is very curious because like social media basically dominates everyone's life. And I meet people all the time at work. I work in a public library, like their basis for the understanding of reality is filtered almost entirely through the internet and through social media. Um, and I guess what I find so surreal about it is I'm, I have all these connections to people. Some of some of my friends on social media are people that I knew like as a child. And then if social media had never been invented, I would have never known what happened to them. Um, but I have like all these connections to people in my life, people in my past, but they're just like mere threads. They're almost like simulations of a friendship. Uh, you know, I've got all this content coming in, pictures of people's vacations, homes, their kids, whatever's going on in people's lives. But you would think it would make you feel connected, but it like just makes you feel isolated. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, uh, it's not real because it's all, it's all digital. Um, the thoughts that they present are being transmitted digitally, the photos. So it, it may, they may as well be holograms or it may as well just be like some channel on your, on your Roku or something, you know, um, we're convinced that like, yeah, it's so great to be back in touch and have each other in each other's lives again. But I mean, how many, you know, what percentage of the people that you're friends with, do you, do you actually have any like meaningful uh, interactions with? And then I also kind of was, was thinking uh, in a weird way, um, the, the bass player, Caleb of As Friends Russ passed away a couple of, of years ago and he and I were, were super tight. He was my, my best man, best, best friend, uh, for, for many, many years, my like adult life. And, um, because of the distance and stuff, we, we had, you know, we would only see each other like once every couple of years for a while. And outside of those in-person kind of, uh, interactions, it it wasn't a whole lot different from now that he's passed away. It was all pictures, right? There are still pictures of him. It was all like, inter, you know, interacting through his Facebook posts or accounts. They still come up in my memories or he still has a page. So it's, it's kind of weird where you almost are just like, all these people from high school that I'm Facebook friends with again, like they could be dead and it wouldn't feel much different. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it is, it is very much, uh, a kind of a simulation. Well, going back to my dog, like trying to explain this type of thing to a kid is always really challenging. Um, but at some point, like as an adult, you kind of grow acclimated to death and then it just becomes like, oh, well, that person who died, they're not here right now. And it's like, you know, they've left town for vacation or something. And that's just how you kind of, at least how I've made death 
manageable for me, but to like try to tell that to a little kid, it's like, oh, holy shit, it feels like some sort of ultimate betrayal or something. Um, yeah, so I guess I guess those are those are the the, the two that really s- stood out to me. Um, are there any other lyrics on on the upcoming album that are like particularly uh, you know people should should check out? Uh, let's see. There's there's a there's a bit of variety. There's a, there's a song about um, debt, just about kind of predatory uh, lending, but like across kind of all touch points of your life. Um, you know, the the second you're old enough to have a a credit card, the offers start coming in, and um, and 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 you're preyed upon because you're at an age where like you don't really have the common sense or the or the understanding of you know uh, finances or 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 interest or whatever. So you you go for it because you you need a new TV and some new furniture. You just got your first place, um, and then it's just like from there it's student loans, car loans, uh, a, a mortgage, a second mortgage, uh, you know. Um, and it's just this this cycle of debt that for a lot of people kind of culminates in in medical debt. Um, so there yeah, we, we it you know, you you kind of alluded to it earlier, but like it it hops around from kind of uh, songs that are more just like personal observations to to, I guess things that are a little bit uh, bigger picture or more more um, political or kind of, social sociopolitical but um it's a pretty varied album i don't know that there's anything uh, i really like the the last song no god some masters i think that's going to be a song that uh that a lot of people relate to and feel bad for relating to uh final form i i i have found is kind of like that too where when people are like man that song's so relatable i want to like apologize you know because it's it's not a great song to relate to but it's a, uh, it's a feeling that you don't hear captured, you know, that often. So I thought it was worth capturing. But No God Some Masters is really about like, um, there's such a call for like activism right now, um, in in light of kind of you know the the spikes in like uh, police violence and, and murder and you know like. Roe v. Wade being overturned and like everywhere we, t- it just seems like everything about this kind of democracy and all the progress we've made has been just sort of, um, you know, we, we've been backsliding and, and peeling it all back. And there's so much reason to like take to the streets. Uh, but, um, but that's hard to do as an adult when you have like your kid has games and you've got, you know, like you have, you you have stuff that like you you all you you're embarrassed to admit that that's why you can't go march or you can't go you know uh, join in on some of this this activity um, because the reasons really are that trite and sort of you know um, just bad excuses really um, but but you've also got to maintain a um, you know a, a it's like trying to maintain a healthy work-life balance. You got to maintain a healthy, like world self balance. Um, so that song is like almost more of like an admission that, uh, you know, there's, there's so much more that I want to do and don't do. And, uh, and a lot of it, I don't really have a good excuse for a good reason for it's just, I'm fucking tired. I'm yeah. busy. I'm tired. And um, and it's very privileged to be able to to not take to the streets to to you know for to fight for these um, kind of injustices that are being inflicted upon people who are not as privileged. Uh, but I'm tired, you know, and I'm embarrassed to say it, but yeah, sometimes you just can't. Yeah, that that resonates with me as well. Um, you know, Josh and I both have young kids that are about the same age. Um, and, you know, it takes a lot out of you to, to be a parent. Um, you know, I would have, would have been a better kid to my parents if I understood how fucking hard it was. Yeah. Um, but, um, the way I, the way I kind of reconcile that for me, at least is, 
uh, like when I was in my teens and my twenties, I was more about activism. I'm, I'm still vegan, but you know, I was more in your face about that and willing to get involved in movements or go to protests. And I, I don't necessarily have the bandwidth for that now with, with kids. Um, but the way that I like think about that is like, okay, well, that was my time center stage to try to influence the world when I had the energy and the belief that I could. Um, now I've kind of, I don't want to say I've given up, but at this stage in my life, I, I don't have a lot of extra energy to expend. And I don't, I, I don't know that I, as an individual, can really make the world a better place anymore. I, I kind of feel like the best I can do is just like make myself into a better person. And then that goodness will play out at, le at the very least in all of my relationships. And then I will have affected, you know, my community, at least in that small way. But for me right now, I, I, I think, well, maybe, maybe this is where I'm supposed to be and what I'm supposed to be doing. I should be working on myself to just make me a more patient person. Um, I know it's probably okay. like a total cop out because uh, some 20 year old is going to comment that I'm like a sellout or whatever. And uh, no, her, her, that 20 year old is, 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 uh, is only 20, you yeah. know? And I think it's, a, I think it's fair. Like everything that you just said, you know, you, you, you did it when you could, you know, you didn't have these other factors in your life that were, that were keeping you from doing it. You're young, you're angry, you got free time. You know, you, you, you aren't like tethered in, in any way. Um, and because you're angry, you are pointing the finger at the world around you. And, and, uh, and a lot of times it's a lot of that is motivated by like, you know, being unsettled, uh, um, uh, yourself emotionally, or, or, you know, like you said, like struggling with, with mental shit, uh, usually undiagnosed at that age, you know, and not knowing how to even just be a fucking normal person. Um, when you get to this stage, you finally do have a grip on that and, and you don't want to lose that grip, you know, like you, you like the growth you've made, the changes you've made. It takes a lot of energy to maintain them, you know, uh, and now you have uh, a, a new project in, instead of like the world. It's, you know, trying to, trying to like be there for, for your kids. So it's, uh, yeah, I think it's, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, but it is, a, it is kind of um, when you hold a mirror up to yourself and you sort of check in with like younger you. To, to see, you know, how much of a disappointment you are, or, or, or maybe it's the opposite, you know, um, it's definitely something that stands out for me where it's like, man, I am just not putting my money where my mouth was. So in September, in September of 2020, when we found out that uh, Daniel Prude had been killed by the Rochester police, some like almost six months prior, I turned to my girlfriend that night and I was like, I'm going down there. And it was like the next month. That's pretty much all I did. And during that three or four week period, possibly a little bit later, but around that time, uh, I got the cake from my girlfriend that said, you know, we're having our second child or whatever. And I have not been to a single protest since then. Yeah. Um, hearing, every, hearing everything you guys said, I'm not going to lie, did kind of bum me out, but I relate and agree to every single word of it pretty much. I don't remember the exact incident within the last six months, but there was one time that something happened and I turned to my girlfriend. And I was like, if there's a protest, I'm going. And she was like, oh, you know, and, and even then I was like, honestly, relieved that there wasn't one that night because I'm like, I don't really want to like get involved with this shit anymore. And I agree with you guys. Like we have more responsibilities now that it's kind of hard to be on the front lines now. But like there's certain things that happen that just kind of flip a switch for me where I'm just like, fuck it. But I will say, too, I don't know if this is touched down and you're in Ann Arbor, right, uh, Damien? Yeah. I don't know if this is touched down there yet, but one issue that would worry me about going to protests now are uh, what's referred to as the Kia boys. Um, kids just going around our city, stealing cars and driving them. And at one point they were like driving them on sidewalks to like hit people and shit, like for a couple of weeks. So that kind of makes me nervous that like some shit like that could happen in a protest too. You know what I mean? Like, I doubt that's really come up in conversation with anybody or anything talking about like potential protests, but I'm just like, that's another thing I don't really want to have to, you know, like factor in, while like going down there and worrying about getting tear gas and other factors, you know what I mean? So. 
Yeah, I yeah. it seems like the rules have 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 changed, or or there just aren't any anymore, and it's getting just a lot more kind of chaotic and and violent. And you know, on one hand, you know that's all the more reason to to get involved, I guess, because something terrible is happening. These, these changes are like you know indicative of something just much worse, kind of a, a brewing. But it's also, yeah, uh, okay, except, but I, like, I have a career and I have a livelihood and I need to, like, provide for my family and I can't really, like, risk those, those things um, as, as, like, uh, you know, freely as I'm, I maybe would have once. Um, I'm sure Greg and I would love to have, keep this going political the whole night um we're both i'm sure you're just as passionate as we are about this too damien but i kind of want to jump back into a little bit more info on the new record it's on end hits records right yeah end hits and then, from uh, germany yep i think this is coming out uh around friday august 4th what's that in relation to the release date for the album uh august 18th all right perfect so this will be a couple weeks before yeah um awesome so have you guys worked with them before and and it's no but we've we've been aware of them for a while um if i'm not mistaken i think we maybe reached out to them once uh but i we didn't have a good track record of like actually coming through with new music it, it we had been sort of alluding to doing new music for years and never really delivering so i think maybe uh our our reputation was kind of, i don't i don't know that anybody wanted to put their eggs in that basket but uh, in 2020, we did two new songs, and I think that's when people were like, "Okay, they're they're not totally full of shit." So uh, he reached out after that, and um, yeah, they have a they have a really good um, roster. They they do really cool things with their packaging. They have good distribution. We were like, uh, "Yeah, I think we were we were considering releasing it ourselves." Um, just because we were not good at shopping shit around or, you know, we don't, we don't really even know who to shop it around to because we've never really been sure what, what kind of band we even are. Uh, so it's hard to, it's hard to hit up labels when you don't know, like, uh, you know, I don't know, like for too melodic or too, too hardcore for this label, too melodic for that label. What are we? Um, so when he hit us up, it was like, all right, yeah, that makes sense. He's got a lot of bands that like we don't necessarily sound like, but we maybe occupy a similar kind of lane of like um, melodic, hardcore, indie, post-hardcore kind of crossover. Um, so yeah, just a just a good fit, and yeah, we had we had had our eye on them for 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 a little bit. Now I saw you guys are playing some stuff in Europe, like in the fall, is it? Uh, end of September into like uh, to October seventh, yeah. Any plans to do anything stateside or just just that so far? We after that we've got two shows. We have uh, we're playing the fest in Gainesville at the end of October, and then on November eighteenth uh, we're playing Brooklyn at St. Vitus, and that's that's all we've got booked for now. I don't. I don't think we've asked this yet. Are you guys, are the members all spread out right now? Like with you being in Michigan, are they all like in Florida and other parts or? Yeah. Uh, two of them are in Florida. Um, one of the guitarists, Joe and our drummer, Tim, uh, the other guitarist, James is in New York. I'm here. Um, we, we never replaced our, uh, bass player after he passed away. Well, he was out of the band before he passed away. Uh, but even then we were like, we can't replace Caleb. Um, so we're, we're just going to operate as like a four piece and, um, and we'll just bring in bass players, uh, uh, you know, as needed. Um, but right now the, the, the bass player who was on most of the album, uh, Andrew, uh, was in against me. He's going to be doing all the Europe dates, all the, those, and both of those two U S dates. So for the foreseeable uh, future he he's he's kind of our de facto bass player and he's uh, also in florida so most of the band uh and band ish you know members are are uh, in florida three out of five 
does that make it obviously it makes it kind of difficult then i'm guessing or is it all like virtual for like like you know getting ready for stuff and whatnot and talking about stuff and it's uh it's different for sure but we've we've finally gotten used to it um practicing we usually just kind of we we each just hope that the others have uh have have done their job and are going to show up like knowing their shit. And then you uh, will usually try to block like the day before a show. Uh, we'll, we'll try to find some rehearsal space or, or, and, and get in a room, run through the set a few times and just make sure that uh, it won't be catastrophic. And then we're pretty good. A lot of the song, I mean, it, it might be a little bit different now with the new songs, but most of those songs are just ancient. So it's like muscle memory. It doesn't take a lot to, to get them, you know, uh, feeling comfortable again. Uh, this will be the first time in a long time that we actually have new material to play. We did play one new song at Furnace Fest last year, um, and that was pretty, pretty uh, comfortable. It, it felt like an old song. So hopefully, the rest of this, <laughs> these upcoming shows will be the same. <clears throat> Three members of one place and two in another sounds familiar, right, Greg? Yeah, yeah, I'm in a band like that. And the pandemic honestly made it easier because we like have this Zoom technology. And, you know, in fact, Josh and I've been doing this podcast together for like a year, like every week. And I think we've seen each other like three times in person since uh, it's pretty wild. I mean, it gets back to the the disconnect we all feel and the the simulation that uh, social media offers us of of social interaction. Yeah, What's... we we wrote and recorded the record this way, and uh, I have a, a another project, Damien Dunn. Um, we stopped. We were doing weekly practices and playing locally until the pandemic, and then we lost uh, our drummer left, and we all just got super busy. But um, the other guitarist and I wrote a a, a full length um, in that time as well. So it's it can be you know. It can be kind of nice. Didn't you release a Damien Dunn album this year too? Yeah, yeah, just a couple months ago or a month. I don't remember the release date actually. Uh, yeah, it's called uh, Total Power. So I guess that's one thing, again, kind of jumping around just a tad. Um, I know we're not talking about all your bands tonight, but like you mentioned the the little gap in 96. Have, have you pretty much stayed active with music throughout the last like 30 some odd years otherwise? No, uh, I ended up leaving As Friends Rust in early 2002. Um, that was at that point the only band that I was in. So that was kind of the first time in a while that I was bandless. Um, that's when I took up guitar a little bit and, and wrote the first batch of Damien Dunn songs. But then uh, I recorded them, I think, in 2003, and then nothing happened um with with the songs at the time and nothing else happened with musically i would do stuff kind of at home on my computer just a little home recording um but i was done uh, at that point and i just kind of got swept off into other stuff and work and you know moving to michigan and then it wasn't until 2008 we did the first uh as friends rust reunion and then 2010 or 11 is when uh rich and i started on bodies and at that point i kind of jumped back into to everything but there was a little break from like 2002 to 2010 i would say where i wasn't even paying attention to uh any like new hardcore or, or it, music in general um nothing new you know i was just one of those guys that you know would just pop in like slip or you know like just old shit and uh and that's how i lived my life for like uh, eight years or so it's kind of weird because now i'm like um i had just voraciously consuming like new music constantly um and i'm super excited about hardcore and have been kind of since jumping back into it i would say i've i've, I've appreciated hardcore more um since on bodies kind of pulling me back into it in like 2010 or so uh, than I ever did in the nineties. Yeah. That's very similar to me. There was like in my early thirties, 
like from like 2000, like 13, 14 ish to like, I got into this really horrific car accident, which was all my fault, uh, like a year before the pandemic. And ever since then, I've just kind of jumped back into it, especially with this podcast. Like when we first started this podcast, and this is why I was excited to do this interview tonight, like we were doing more like 90s, like Buffalo hardcore, well, Buffalo, Syracuse, Rochester hardcore interviews, you know what I mean? Um, but then after a while, we started interviewing more newer guests and shit. And this is kind of made me more check out like tons of new music and shit and i'm I'm definitely grateful to be doing this because otherwise i don't know if i would be keeping up with nearly as much like current uh hardcore because obviously right now is like the most like prolific era we've ever seen for like new releases and shit it's like every day there's like you, you look on Bandcamp, it's like like 10 new releases every day pretty much it's insane you know yeah yeah so, so many bands and and the scene is just massive right now um getting a lot of attention kind of in, in a way like feels sort of similar to early mid nineties when some hardcore bands were starting to sort of, you know, uh, blow up a bit, but yeah, it's, it's kind of exciting times. It's, it's very like diverse, very inclusive. It, it just feels like a, um, it, I wish I were 20 in this, this hardcore scene. Uh, it'd be, it'd be, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. yeah no this is like, like like i said stepping out for a couple of years and then i didn't really i went to maybe two shows in 2019 and then obviously everything was shut down for a little while and then uh i've talked about the show a couple of times on here but when i saw zulu play here last year for the first time that's when i was like holy shit like this we got like people of all walks of life here for this like i know zulu is obviously like more of a far-reaching band that can bring people together like that but like even we have a couple local bands now like only shallow is playing the show that I'm booking this weekend that will already happen by the time this airs. I feel like they they draw a pretty diverse group of people too, you know? So it's definitely cool to see because I feel like hardcore has always been the platform that's supposed to be inclusive like this. You know what I mean? It's supposed to have people from all walks of life in bands and doing their thing. And I know people like us were never the ones that would like, like act like people couldn't do it. But for some reason, it seemed like people thought that it was just more for like suburban white kids. You know what I mean? Like that's, and it's yeah. not, you know, I'm definitely, I, I've, I've never lived in the suburbs, you know what I mean? Like I, like, I know a lot of people that, you know, but definitely that's the vibe that I got, especially coming into hardcore, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot of it. I mean, a, a lot of the scene and especially back then was suburban white kids, you know, I guess it was, it was regionally specific, like New York hardcore scene sure wasn't, but then DC was like nothing but, you know, um, I think I related more to like to 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 minor threat for that reason because like I did live in like a little house and a little kind of like um I guess as much of a suburb as, as as you've got you know down there well Miami's all pretty spread out so in a weird way it is all all suburbs but um yeah it it's cool because I feel like you had you know bands like like bad brains or limp wrist or you know spit boy or bikini kill they all like were sort of tokenized it was like they're the you know all black hardcore band or or uh or you know the like uh gay positive hardcore band and and it was almost like a box had been ticked like yeah now we've got diversity in this scene um but then it it still felt and maybe it was just kind of uh our era or or whatever but it still felt like to me like the hardcore scene was all the white male faces i'd see at in the culture crowd you know um i'm sure there was other stuff happening in other in other places and and we were in a pretty niche kind of uh much maligned little splintered kind of a uh, group of hardcore at the time but nonetheless, it, it did feel like overwhelmingly like that. And now you look around and it's like, there it's just all like, there's just diversity across the entire, uh, you know, spectrum of like hardcore bands. And, and it's not a, it's not like a, yeah, it doesn't feel like as, as tokenized. It just feels like there are people of color, there are trans people, there are like, you know, gay, queer people like all over the place. Um, playing every style of hardcore with the mic, you know, behind the drums on a guitar. It's just, it's, it, it's being kind of like um, saturated with, with uh, um, some much needed like color, you know, that was missing uh, for a while. Yeah. 
And I referenced there being like thousands of bands right now. And I've mentioned on here before that, like, and I mentioned earlier in this interview, I guess, too, like, you, there's not very many, like, usually back in the day, there would be a couple like shitty local bands. And like, then you'd hear like all the good bands, but like, there's not that many, like, like lower tier, like, like, like not good bands now. You know what I mean? It's like everything, like these people all know how to write good riffs now. It's crazy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the, the biggest offense a band can, can be accused of now is maybe just like, just playing a style of hardcore that you maybe you know subjectively find like kind of boring or uninteresting but most likely it's it's re it's at the very least recorded well and, and written well because it's hard to it's hard to put out a shitty record now yeah it's crazy because like traditional and like new york hardcore has always been like some of my favorite shit but now it's like it's like you're saying like when i hear new bands like i don't really want to hear that anymore because what can you really do with like like all due respect like i love new york hardcore but like there's nothing really new to do with that sound unless you incorporate like some of the modern shit into it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. otherwise it's, it's going to sound like every other band that came out of there, you know? So, um, yep. but Greg, you got any other, anything else you want to touch on before we start wrapping up and having Damien uh, uh, drop yeah, we, any other, we hit up, uh, hit up the lyrics for as friends rust. So thank you, um, for that. I just wanted to add that, uh, um, your lyrics, you know, across all the different bands you've been in have been really meaningful to me. Um, you know, I, I put them in, in a, in a special place, um, just because they kind of asked more of me than a lot of, you know, like punk and hardcore lyrics ask more of you than, than pop music, but you know, your lyrics, bands like earth crisis, um, you know, those, those lyrics ask even more of you, uh, intellectually and, and, uh, then, uh, than pretty much most other hardcore bands. So I just wanted to to take this time just to thank you for, for what you've done uh, uh, lyrically. It's really meant a lot to me, uh, you know, over the last 20 years. Wow. Thank you, man. That's, that's huge. Uh, I, I know who those singers were like are, you know, for, for me, you know, they're, they're like all the hardcore singers. And then there's like, you know, there, there's always going to be like that, Dan O'Mahony or Dave Smalley or just somebody who like there was something about the way they'd articulate something that just resonated uh, differently or the, or they addressed something I hadn't really heard addressed before or whatever. So it's yeah, it's it's crazy to be kind of uh, somebody like that for <laughs> for for anybody and 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 I think that's I guess what I've always been been chasing since kind of realizing like you know. Um, yeah, maybe that was like within my grasp. Maybe I could write something that like that that matters. I guess to put a finer point on it, like everyone in hardcore is angry. Every hardcore band has angry lyrics, but like your lyrics, they're angry and they're intelligent and you've got to be smart to like really get the most out of them. So that was always the kind of lyrics I gravitated towards. So thank you for doing that. I appreciate I'll it. Shut up. I'll shut up being a fanboy now. <laughs> no, that's that's I very cool. Thank you. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, Greg. When I sent Greg the message saying we were gonna interview Damien, he said he was excited, but I didn't. I didn't realize he was this excited. So, um, well, Greg, if you don't have any other questions, I think this is this has turned out to be a pretty good interview. Um, Damien, if you have any other plugs, I know we didn't talk about all you probably all your current projects. I try to keep it mostly like hardcore adjacent, as they say, or whatever. Yeah. Um, but if there's anything we didn't touch on that you want to plug or anything like that, or um. I think we covered it. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, yeah, the new, new Asperger's Russ coming out. New Damien Dunn just came out. Um, I guess I may as well. I'm also doing a, a death metal band called Ecstasis, and then uh, what we're calling a glam rot uh, band, which is basically hair metal with, with death metal vocals uh, band. Um, the the guy from Ecstasis and I. Uh, that's called Casket. We have a couple songs up on Bandcamp, and. Um, archive podcast is josh lyons and greg benoit with creative support from rob antonucci this podcast is a product of the rochester hardcore community theme song provided by stand fast visit hardcore archive podcast on linktree to listen to past episodes follow hardcore archive podcast and enterprise hardcore podcast on instagram for updates if you have an idea for an episode or would like to have your band's music featured during the closing credits please contact us at hardcorearchivepodcast at gmail.com.